Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm really sorry that I'm now looking at slides and not looking at you guys, but um, I just thought some of these may just help you to uh, see what I'm thinking about. So um, I'm going to talk about advanced care planning. Um, I want you to think of it as future wishes rather than this really formal name, advanced care planning. And for, for me, and this slide shows you, when living every year, month, day and hour, a minute counts. Okay, next slide, please. So I know I'm talking to a slightly younger generation and I, I'm, I'm, you know, people who are going to have conversations, hopefully with families, um, and I wanted to just show you why advanced care planning or future wishes is so very important. Um, future wishes mean that families talk together with their relatives about what they want. And that means not only do the, the, the person who is making the future wishes document an advanced care plan tell people what they want, but it also means that siblings so people's children also talk together about what their parents want. Um, this is really important because it helps families come together and know what's important. I often see quite a lot of conflict between uh, brothers and sisters and you know um, other members of families if, when they haven't been consulted. Um, when somebody gets poorly about what they think should happen, because we're all different. We all have different experiences. Um, if you're me, uh, you're one of five siblings, and my youngest brother is 18 years younger than me. So that means that my family, my brothers and sisters, have quite different views about where they are in their life, which means that we have probably different views about being older and becoming ill and possibly dying. Because my mother has been very clear and she's done one of these advanced care plans, actually we all know now what she thinks and we sort of accepted that and talked to her and we now all agree. So hopefully, and I don't promise it will all be like that, but where you see the happy family on the bottom there, that's probably, I hope, how my family feel about what my mother has decided. When families don't talk, we do see disputes when people are poorly about what they think should happen. And you can um, prevent some of that by thinking ahead. Also, if you are an older person, sometimes when we're older, our younger families think that they know what's best for us. Actually, I know what's right for me, and you probably do too. So it helps older people to have their say about what's actually important to them. And things and our thoughts change as we get older. Colin, next slide. So, advanced care planning. It has lots of different bits to it, okay? This kind of care plan is what we're thinking about for ourselves for the future. Colin, if you can put all the little blocks into the slide set, okay? These are the different elements that you might see doctors talking about, okay? When you make a future wishes plan, you can, firstly, in the top left, let people know what you think. You can also, in the top right, ask somebody to speak for you. So, my mother has got three daughters and two sons. And actually, she said two of the daughters know very much how she feels and how she thinks. She's asked that those two people, it wasn't a popularity contest, it was just that those two people were quite similar to her. And so she said, I want you to be the one if I can't. Um, um, Okay, sorry, there's a chat in the chat box, it's distracting me. Um, you can ask that person to speak for you, so you can name somebody. But don't see it if your relative doesn't name you as they don't care about you. They may want you to do a specific job, um, and they may want another relative to do another specific job. Um, a personal wishes plan can also do something called refuse treatment. And this is when you tell 
doctors and uh, people, the kind of things that you don't want. Okay, so I'm fairly certain being a doctor, doctors, doctors are our own worst enemy because we've seen everything. We tend to have very particular views about the kinds of things we do and don't want. So I'm very certain about the things that I don't want people to do to me. Um, and finally, you can appoint somebody in a very formal process to make decisions for you. Colin, you move on. Okay, so some things are what we call informal. That means they're not in the law. So advanced statements and naming somebody, so saying my daughter Jill, um, are not are what we call informal, which means in law they can they have to be heard, but they don't have any rights. You can do very formal things, that's down at the bottom, like advanced decisions to refuse treatment and appointing somebody as a power of attorney or having a, a do not resuscitate form. Those are all formal and legally binding. So doctors have to listen to that power of attorney. Okay, They have to listen to your views if you are a power of attorney. So that's why it's a good thing to do. Because sometimes doctors will have different views to the power of attorney. Move on. Okay, so if you can fill in all the boxes for me, Colin. Okay, just so that you know about the different types of care funds, because people talk about care funds a lot. Care funds that are about the here and now, are about what do I need you to do for me today. So you'll see lots of things like care funds in a relative's house, left by nursing staff like district nurses or left by um, uh, care staff, which tell other nurses and not other care staff how to deal with somebody's personal needs. If it's about the future, we call it an advanced care plan. Okay? Some things are clinical. Okay? And clinical means done by doctors and nurses, which means that they are a plan for other doctors and nurses okay to follow to make sure your relative has the right care a clinical future plan is often something called an emergency care plan and in some areas called respect and that's a clinical plan written with a family and a patient for other clinicians other doctors which tell them the kind of things so let me give you an example in a clinical advanced care plan it might say what you want if you were to break your leg. It might say what you want to do if you have a heart attack at home, but therefore other doctors, all right? But they've listened and talked to you. Okay, this is the hard bit, and it's hard for you, and it's hard sometimes for us. So, Conversations about dying, conversations about getting ill, and conversations about your relative maybe not being here are really hard to have. Um, sometimes we think that our older relatives don't want to talk about things because we might upset them. But actually, sometimes your relative really does because they're worrying. Relatives want to tell you so that they have all their affairs in order, so that they can be buried in a timely fashion. They want all their things in order. They may want to have a particular type of funeral, so they want you to know. They may want to have meet other members of the family who live far away, so they want you to know so that you can let them know. So the trouble is, if we all don't talk about it because we know it might make us sad, actually, sometimes that makes the older person actually more fed up because they can't tell you about these things because they're worried that they might upset you, their children, their family, because they think that we don't want to talk about it. Um, I'm going to tell you something as well. Doctors and nurses found it find it hard to... Um, 
in an ideal world we want to save everybody and we want everybody to live forever and have a great life but actually knowing that we will all one day die and actually dying and having a good time dying time is important to doctors too but it is hard for us to talk about so sometimes we don't either next slide so what i want you to do when you go away because you will think about this afterwards you have to think about these things you have to think about it for yourself like i've done you have to think about it for your relatives like my mother's done you need to talk about it because thinking about it isn't enough if you think about it and they think about it but you don't talk about it nobody knows once you've talked about it you need to write it down and then you need to share that information because you might have talked with a daughter or a mother but you might have other brothers and sisters who need to know and you also might need a doctor and a nurse to know so think about it talk about it with each other record it if you can or ask for help to do that and then share it with everybody so that everybody knows what you want next slide we have done what we call a resource which means that we put lots of information together because we know sometimes lots of people know they should have this conversation but don't so this picture here shows you of a guide that we put together which can be for doctors and nurses but it is also for families and people who may want to think about their future wishes and it has things like videos and it has things like booklets and links to things and phone numbers of where you can find more information next slide this is just a picture of uh, some of the information another slide, another move on okay so this just reminds you and this takes me down to our last bit something called a conversation starter pack because we know that these conversations are really hard um, we worked with the Alzheimer's Society to come up with some topic cards that could help people have conversations with their families some of it is the technical stuff the legal stuff you need to know but also it helps you think about arranging your thoughts when you have a conversation and when you do the talking about it bit with your family so it covers some of those legal things like power of attorney and wills and but it also helps you think about uh, medical decisions and what your care should look like so that resource we put a website address but also it's in that guide next slide Colin. And that's me so that's just a quick run through doesn't cover everything but i hope it gives you a little bit of an idea why you should do future wishes and advanced care planning what kinds of things you need to do think about it talk about it share share it and write it down and some of the tools and resources that we have that you might be able to use thanks Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and just, I, I feel I, I ought to um, own up to that. It wasn't me moving the slides on, by the way, it was funny. <laughs> but I was, uh, I was happily taking the credit for that. So thank you for that. So can I just introduce then our second presenter, which is Kulvan Sandu. And Kulvan is an AM nurse from the Mental Capacity Act and Dementia. Um, and she works with Lisa Community Healthcare and NHS Trust. So I'll hand over to, to Colban. We are, we are going to take some questions for both Sarah and Colban, but, but after they've both uh, presented it, that's okay. And, and as we said at the start, if, if you think of some questions as, as we're going along, do put them in the chat box, um, and because we're, we're, we're monitoring the chat box, and we'll pick the questions up when, uh, when Colban's finished. Over to you, Colin. Thank you, Colin. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Colin Spandu. Um, I'm going to talk to you now just about, um, you heard from Sarah around the importance of 
advanced care planning and having these conversations. So I'm going to talk to you more from a practical sense of how we have done and how you can start doing well with your family members and loved ones. And um, for the first thing is just to acknowledge that there is a need to facilitate some of these discussions because sometimes uh, they may not happen spontaneously, we may need to facilitate them to give that space and opportunity for our family members or loved ones to have conversations like this. And also, like Sarah mentioned, these conversations can be difficult. But at the same time, acknowledging that the uh, consequences uh, of not having these conversations, of missed opportunities, is sometimes not knowing what our loved ones or family members want to happen, especially when they are no longer able to make those decisions for themselves. But leading on to that, the sooner you have these conversations, although it's, it's hard sometimes to start them, it is better before the person loses capacity, and certainly while they can give you um, give you their views and opinions and make choices themselves, they're um, certainly good to start them soon. And, and also just being mindful as well that there will be a time where some of these conversations need to be passed on to professionals so that the information is shared so that professionals know uh, what your family members want and how to act or proceed uh, if it's a, something that's unpredictable or an emergency situation. But also for yourself as well, um, you know, you don't need to have all the answers about some of this when it comes to advanced care planning. I suppose your role, your role would more be about opening up the discussion and gathering that information and making sure that you can pass it on to people that need to know whether it's other family members or professionals. So how to start a conversation? Um, it will be important, as I said, to have the opportunity for family members to have these discussions, but they can be done sensitively and really well by people who know them best, uh, far better for other family members or people that they're close to to initiate these discussions, sometimes bring strangers to come in and have these personal conversations with them. The key is using open questions, that open questions to them about their worries, concerns or, or wishes for the future. You may um, notice one way to start the conversation is you may get cues or prompts from your family member um, about it. So, for example, your family member may have some of these, um, may say some of these statements just around uh, scenarios or things happening at the moment that they might expect a loved one to go into hospital, they might be worried about the current pandemic or the virus at the moment, or they might say something along the lines of if something was to happen to me or when I'm not around, etc. And those are actually quite good prompts or opportunities for you to then ask open questions back to say, well, actually, what are your thoughts about that? Or what is worrying you uh, that you want to tell me? Or, or what would you want to happen if something became unwell? Or if you're not here anymore, what is it that you want that's important that you want to happen first for us to know? So, how I've broken it down is how you can sort of initiate these conversations and what subjects focus on it in sort of four different areas. And the first bit is um, I, I say the sort of uh, the easy perhaps topics that you might know about them and they may be able to talk to you about. What's important to them? So that's uh, their cultural or religious uh, beliefs, spiritual needs, family or friends, uh, diet, uh, food, favourite foods and drinks, um, where they live and any particular hobby or interest that they've got that they would want to still try and maintain or have a part of their life. The question you can ask around that is, what would you want someone to know about you, like your routines? Uh, or what makes you feel happy and secure? Uh, or so what's important to you um, if you do follow a religion and practice? What's important if someone is helping you that you want them to know about that to help support you carry on doing with that? In the next uh, second little stage of conversations are more practical conversations. Um, and I can relate to this in my own experience with family members um, when uh, when we've had my father who was uh, certainly uh, ill, but we had practical conversations uh, which were far more easier than some of the more emotional advanced and planning conversations. These practical conversations were far easier to start in the first place. So things around finances, you may think up the topic of if they need to help managing their finances or paying their bills or the basics of getting to banks. 
uh, is it an idea of setting up online access uh, banking or telephone banking if there would be a point in time where the health might deteriorate and you may not be able to get there themselves practically or be remade that will just take them out as much? Finding out if there's any wills in place, uh, like Sarah mentioned, any of the legal processes that might be needed, like uh, powers of attorney or any advanced decisions to reduce treatment that the examiner wants to make. And yes, it's practical, but can be uh, you know sensitive. Any fu you know, funeral arrangements that they would want you to think about um, and for you to know that what's important for them to have, especially any sort of uh, rituals or ceremonies that's really important to have uh, in their funeral. But those practical questions that you can ask um, is sort of who would you trust or who would you want to help you manage your finances? Would you want to carry doing that in person if you can? Or would you want to have sort of telephone online banking access if possible? And then moving on there's so that third stage around some of the more uh, more serious decisions, I suppose, around care, care decisions. Um, Again, this is about how they want people to be involved in providing care to them or advocating their views or wishes. Um, dignity and independence, especially around personal care as well. Um, their preference for communication, what language do they prefer? Do they need any, any aids or any help um, to help them communicate? And where would they like to be cared for? Um, home environment, but also uh, take into consideration perhaps respite care. If there uh, may be a time where uh, yourself or some member of the carers may need um, a break or may need some respite, is there a preference where they would want to go to? And certainly, choices around end of life care as well, uh, whether that, that is staying home or it's using hospices, uh, what their preference should be when they get to that stage and they need to have a bit support. So, how to open up these questions? Um, it's asking how do you want to be supported with your care needs, uh, practically washing, dressing, uh, decisions to help. Uh, and just an example, again a personal example, um, when my father was terminally unwell, I have two older brothers, and you know, when it came to sort of his personal care needs, although I'm the only health professional in my family, he was very adamant for his personal care needs, he didn't want me as his, uh, a female, his daughter, to be involved in that side. Um, however, he was happy for me to be involved in helping him uh, with uh, expressing his views and wishes about certain treatment. So those sort of practical things as siblings as well that we we didn't think about initially, but it was important we got that from him to understand his views as well around that. Uh, similar to that second bullet point, if you were to receive personal care um, from somebody that isn't a family member or doesn't know you, what is it that you want them to know about you? What's important? Is it a certain routine that you have when we get in the mornings? Is it a certain way that you do think that you want that care that's helping you to do that as well? Especially to maintain that independence and dignity. There's some things that you would want to try and keep doing yourself. And certainly other questions like where, where would you want to be cared for if you no longer could remain at home? And that could be a really difficult question um, because for many people, they would not want to remain at home or they would want to have support for as long as possible in, in their home environment. But it's also approaching that question realistically if there may be a chance that may not be possible, it's just finding that from them then um, what other options or what other preferences they would want. And sorry, that final bullet point as well what are your wishes around uh, end of life care? What's important to you? And that's more around comfort, being pain free, having a family around, being at home for as long as possible. So, and again, again, opening that sort of open question raised, asking them what, what matters to them, what they really want to prioritise. And then, fourth and the final bit, which becomes a bit more, um, you know, the more serious things, are the medical decisions. And this is certainly where you need some support. Uh, from professional demands to help with these conversations. But the key thing around the medical decisions and talking about them in this way is it can help reduce hospital admission of them, uh, especially if um, it allows the family members to be in control of what happens to them in the future if they can express preference or wish. Uh, and it certainly helps with the family members as well um, in making decisions, especially when it's unplanned circumstances or emergencies when your family member may suddenly come unwell. 
Uh, there's obviously four more processes like DNA, CPR, and also consider organ donation because you may be asked that uh, by the health professionals. And again, it's you know it's a conversation that we I didn't have with my father beforehand, only until he became very young. I wish I had done. Um, so I have attached a link on that um, just from the organ donation uh, NHS website which has a really good link around um, around different faiths and beliefs and organ donation just to help you, uh, just to help you have a look at if there's some particular religious view that you want the family member you want to respect um, as well. The questions to ask are things such as, is there anything that worries them? Or have they got any fears or worries about if they became unwell or they think they're worried about that might happen to them? And what are their thoughts on life prolonging treatments um, now or in the future? Have they got a view about that? Uh, is there a point where they would not want to continue anymore with some treatments? And, and again, looking back to early personal experience, for my father, it's very much because of cancer, and it's a chemo that he at one point got to a stage where I don't want this anymore now. And he's really clear in expressing that, and we were able to follow that through. And certainly, if they've got any specific views about any treatments that they would want to refuse, uh, and certainly, is there anything that they would want to happen in a medical emergency that's important for you to know about? So, some tips and conversations. It's been heard that this isn't a one off. Um, certainly from my own experience, these conversations evolved over time, uh, over months and months. Um, it's not just a one-off conversation, it can take time, um, but it's also recognising your own needs as well when you have these conversations. And when you read it, it's important to give yourself some time as well um, and come back to it when you need to. And I know it might feel that some of these conversations you might want to put off, however, certainly the earlier you have them, the more chance there is for your family member to think about it, talk about it, and certainly share their views and wishes with you. And the key is to allow time and space um, and talk to no judgments. Uh, as I said, don't make it an interview, make it a conversation, get a cup of tea, making it as informal as relaxed as you can is the best way to let these conversations happen without it seeming um, like an interview, really, or lots of questions being asked. And certainly, Everyone's preferences can change over time, and it is important sometimes to revisit conversations and don't make assumptions. Uh, as I said, it, you know, my father initially had chemo, but after a certain point, uh, it was when he wanted to stop it, and you could tell, um, you could tell that he was getting more upset by it, and, and that's when he sort of revisited his decision around some of that treatment. Be mindful that these conversations are really sensitive for all involved, yourselves, uh, the person, the professional, but it is really key that you get some support with them as well. Um, and also, you know, this one as well, it's just accepting that you may have different views between yourself and your family members around some of these decisions. Um, and it's important to give yourself that emotional space, but don't be afraid to make your views clear about what you feel, but at the same time, allow them to express what they want as well. And it is their individual decision, um, but certainly, Having these conversations can help reduce the, those feelings of guilt or, or pressure, especially when there's a medical crisis and you're not quite sure what your family member would have wanted. Pick your time. <laughs> Pick your time and uh, stop this course of distress. Try it again later on. Um, again, and, you know, for me, personal experiences, the best time was always when we were doing something practical, when I was taking my father to the bank, driving him in the car, or taking to food shopping. It was when it was more relaxed and it was more informal in the car journey for those 20, 25 minutes, would you be much more engaged and want to sort of talk about some of these things? And sometimes it was in the afternoon when we had some cup of tea and he was just relaxed, it was just the two of us. With the other opportunity, uh, opportunist times that we would have some discussions. And as I've said, uh, um, no at times that you would want to involve health professionals because you might not know all the options around the treatment or perhaps around end of life care. So it's fine and it's good to involve professionals to help you go through what options are available with you and family members so that you can then have to think about them and talk about them together. And that might be people like the GP, it might be district nurses uh, if they're involved who can help explain things to you around what's available treatment-wise or especially end of life care. 
I'm just similar uh, to sharing the resource uh, that Sarah shared earlier around um, recording it and sharing it. So this is available, uh, uh, the website links there on our uh, Yorkshire Hoover uh, Community Network website. And it's a document you can download and it covers the four sections I've talked about today around um, those areas, it gives you some ideas of those questions. And you can start jotting down perhaps um, things that family members might say or decide. But this is certainly a, a good document you can use and download and start jotting down over the time uh, some of the family members' views or wishes. And I just want to share this with you as well, the select forms, um, which some of you may have seen or be familiar with, some of you might have a family member that has them. Uh, they replaced the DNA CPR forms, which was sort of, uh, had a red border around them, uh, and these are used in leads, and they used in these for a little while now. Um, they are similar to DNA CPR forms, except for these are filled in by professionals and a copy should be left with your family member. Um, but they also go on to put a bit more detail around some of the things you talked about around medical decisions, any preferences or wishes around where they want to be cared for, if they don't want hospital admission, uh, or any treatments they don't particularly want to have, if they want to prioritise comfort, uh, pain management perhaps. Um, this is a form that more professionals will use to record those wishes as well. But that can be helpful if you do have those conversations with your family members to also let professionals know that they can also make a record of it too. And the final thing to uh, share is the same resource packet that Sarah shared earlier. It just gives you a bit more detail um, about how you can get some of these conversations started.